a year and a half ago, I was at a discussion meeting at the Royal Academy, led by sculptor Anthony Gormley, who is Alistair Parvin of Wikihouse and others. At one point, Gormley said, art is what we do, culture is done to us. Architecture must move from culture to art to release inherent agency. Defining architecture as a verb, Gormley continues, we need to refine creativity. The most important thing we can make together alongside meals and babies is our homes. Focusing on the possibility of self-built housing, he concluded, can we become agents of our context again? This is exactly where Walter Siegel's path led him. Siegel was a very educated and well-read gentleman. But art for him was not contained in the paintings of his father or his father's famous friends at that amazing moment of Central European modernism in the 1920s. Art is what we do and its quality is in its doing. From the art of cooking to the art of building a home, a title I'll come back to. It's in the mode of being, not in its products as objects. Thus, Siegel would have absolutely no interest in the veneration of objects as listed buildings. He was no building fetishist. To work on a building site as I had to in those years, he said, was a horror for me. The working conditions were degrading and inhuman. I had always a desire not only to assist to change conditions for those for whom you build, but particularly for those with whom you build. For Siegel, architecture, and really all his life he meant housing architecture, was process, not product, was a social activity enabled by design, an activity wherein was its art. John Ruskin, a century earlier, famously and most memorably in the nature of the Gothic essay, contrasts abstract architecture, fixated on notions of visual perfection and wherein the actual builders were, to quote Ruskin, mere enslaved cogs, the workmen so degraded. He contrasts this with real architecture, which is less predetermined, forever experimental, even unfinished, and wherein, to quote again, there is a perpetual change in design and execution and the workmen are altogether set free. The former he calls classic and the latter Gothic, names from his time, which need not disturb us. The builder of his real architecture, which he also at times names a natural architecture, has six qualities. I quote, a rude savageness, a love of change and variety, love of nature, disturbed imagination, obstinacy and generosity. Not a way we are used to seeing critics classify architects, architecture today. But in rereading this at the weekend just now, I was astonished how well this fits the person of Walter Siegel, but also his architecture. Independence, love of change and variety, love of nature, disturbed imagination, obstinacy, and generosity. With his real architecture, Ruskin continues, the builders never let ideas of outside symmetries and consistencies interfere with the real use and value of what they did. If they wanted a window, they built one, regardless of conventionalities of external appearance. With a large building or tight context, every successive architect built the pieces he added in his own way, utterly regardless of the style adopted by his predecessors. That's Ruskin's words, of course. By obstinacy, he means the peculiar energy which gives tension to movement and stiffness to resistance, a building not hiding its muscular structure behind a cultured decoration. And so he goes on. It was this essay of Ruskin's which particularly sparked off William Morris, with its suggestion that art is nothing less than an expression of social conditions in their entirety. In the New York Review, just a couple of weeks ago, R.H. Lossin wrote that, Ruskin crystallized the deficiencies and disappointments that organized the psychic life of a youthful Morris into a positive argument about a loss of pleasure in work. In Ruskin's real architecture, the workmen, as I already quoted, are not only unburdened by their work, but altogether set free. 
by performing it. Lawson continues, if Morris's political writing can be said to have a unifying quality, it is certainly the centrality of pleasure. Gormley, looking at self-build, asked, can we become agents of our context again? Siegel in the 1980s talked about the very enjoyable task to build your own house using your own hands to do something. This offers a great element of happiness. It is also, of course, a risky business. And Siegel said, I needed an element of adventure, an element of risk, and the innovative elements were intoxicating and intoxicated my clients. As the survivor in News From Nowhere, William Morris's Utopia, says, here I could enjoy everything without an afterthought that the injustice and the miserable toil of others had made my pleasure, my leisure. In a talk I gave in Italy 43 years ago, just as Siegel was starting in Lewisham, in fact, I noted this interesting, strong, but quiet English tradition coming ultimately from Ruskin and Morris, from Ruskin's vivid emphasis on the relation between the intellectual and the workman, between the workman and the surface he's working. In that uh, piece, I then looked at the work of Chad Cullen and, and others, as well as Siegel, I was discussing design for comprehensible construction, taking up the notion of transparency of production from the writer Colin Ward's book, Anarchy in Action, with its quite subtle argument for building whose functioning is transparent, products having a transparency of operation and repair. I noted that Siegel's houses really do have that transparency of operation and repair in a very direct way. They, <clears throat> they are inhabitable because their occupants feel at home in shells which they know they can change, extend, adapt without frustration, even if they never will do. Comprehensible construction, civilized ordinariness with legible details and finish encourages an activity, <coughs> an active occupancy and signs of that occupancy. The rhetoric of production and occupation replaces that of consumption in housing. Siegel said that he aimed for, I quote, an architecture of itself, rather than one fixated on engaging in culture wars about its visual appearance. Going right back to when he graduated in 1932, Siegel said that I was then thinking it might be desirable to produce a non-denominational non kind of architecture. You can find another word for it. You can call it natural architecture. You would design with techniques and with materials quite naturally. You wouldn't have any other intellectual aim. I wanted to build what I believed in those days was just simply a natural building. I had no desire to make a great effort to convince others or to excite others. I didn't want more than to satisfy and particularly to please. Siegel's question then became Ruskin's. How can one perform one's own designing to encourage the participative designing of others? That is their freedom to be involved creatively. Ruskin's bad, what I call abstract architecture, often symmetrical, geometric, and easily executed with absolute precision, as he exemplifies in ancient Greece, he called servile and the builder a slave. And his real architecture, however, for him best seen in the buildings of medieval Christianity, gloried in things small as much as great, and also, which I continue to quote, confessed its imperfection. Indeed, its principal admirableness is that out of the fragments full of imperfection and betraying that imperfection in every touch, they indulgently raise up a stately whole. Siegel gloried in his self-builders. I now quote him. They had also the opportunity to discover how joyful it can be to work. And you can also develop as a person. I noticed at Lewisham over a couple of years, they develop a personality quite beyond expectation. And it also gives their architect the greatest enjoyment to see. And of course, there is much slow learning and mistakes, but oh, what development. Back to Ruskin, 
a century earlier, who said, in the make of nature of every man, however rude or simple, there are powers for better things, which can only be strengthened if we value and prize them in their imperfections. You can teach a man to draw and cut a straight line or a curved one precisely and repeat it until done with perfect precision. But if you ask him to think about these forms, to consider if he might improve it, he stops, becomes hesitant. 10 to one, he thinks wrong. He makes a mistake in his first touch as a creative thinking being. Siegel delighted in the self-builder's mistakes, improvisations and adaptations. We have freed ourselves from the architect designed facade at last, he said. His concept, said one self-builder about Siegel, is that if he makes you sit down and think about the drawings, you will understand what to do. And another self-builder added to me, he taught us to think for ourselves and gave us such confidence that when we finished our houses, we felt we could want to do anything we set our minds to. He literally changed our lives. My quotation from Ruskin ends almost identically if in Victorian terms. If you ask him to think about these forms, to consider if he might improve it, he stops, becomes hesitant, 10 to one makes a mistake, but you have made a man of him for that. He was only a machine before, an animated tool. J.D. Seddings famously, in, he famously encaptured this Ruskin-Morris theme, though the phrase is often attributed to C.R. Macintosh. There is hope in honest error, none in the icy perfections of the mere stylist. The first is lively, the other deadly. Now, excuse me. I have here sketched a Siegel intellectual trail from Ruskin and Morris. It could have been worth a detour to take in Mutasius' study of the late 19th century English house, and certainly the early 20th century <coughs> first garden city housing of Raymond Unwin. Unwin had been inspired by Ruskin and Morris. He became secretary of Morris's Socialist League in his youth, and amazingly, at the age of 70, was consultant to Roosevelt's New Deal in the States. He, the author many years earlier of The Art of Building a Home, was the one person whom Walter Siegel, on first reaching England, was most anxious to meet in person. Siegel, who of course knew Tout and Gropius, Mies and Mendelssohn at close quarters. Siegel's avoidance of heroes and his natural soft spot for the underdog and the neglected had led him when young to march Stan. To understand a man, Napoleon said, look at his world when he was 21. And we learn much about Walter Siegel from what Stan was doing when Siegel was 21. In 1928, Stan was completing a retirement home in Frankfurt, which is illustrated in our new book and about which many years later, Siegel wrote, the immaculate detail is still visible today. Beyond this, there is a new feeling of space and ease and lightness. Its elegance was natural and, I concentrate, quite free from overemphasis on visual accents, which was already clouding the minds of other designers. This description comes close to a definition of Siegel's own goals in building. Stam himself had written in V. Bauen, man must learn to renounce any desire for representation or character. He must accustom himself to another measure of value than that of White House front or the use of expensive materials. He must restrict his demands, but despite this, he has the right to equal cost of dwellings, maximum usefulness and an increased convenience. That was Siegel exactly. Look, to put it simply, just as I end, one could say housing has four dimensions. Its visual image, its tractability as money, its physically embedded, physically assembled form, and its ability to enrich inhabitation. My long dead friend, Bob Evans, Robin Evans, proposed the two constituencies of, constituents of emblem and in, instrument. Two of my four forces are largely emblematic, its visual and financial representation. 
and these seagulls tried to fade to an appropriate level of unimportance. He had no interest in historians' stylistic tropes, as I've explained, nor in housing as buried treasure, Martin Paul's nice phrase. Hence his engagement in the 1940s with support for socially owned universal health service, universal education service, and land for housing. He would talk of 40-year leases as being ideal. The other two more instrumental dimensions, the formation of the house and then its convivial inhabitation, he raised in social importance. The home, Siegel said, must appeal not just to the eye, but to the being of the builder and of the inhabitant. These last two merge in self-building, where being the builder builds your being. And only then, in Anthony Gormley's phrase where I started, we can become agents of our context again. <laughs>